So, <laughs> wow. Um, staying within the home, Sadhguru, and the relationship dynamics of the family. In my family, um, I have one daughter and, and I have sons, many sons. See, you are also prejudiced. Oh no, no! On, on which side? On which side would you think? On which side would you think? On the male side. How did you know? So okay, so in my family, you have four boys. Yeah, my do there we go. But my daughter is very close to her father. Do we have that in many families where the young lady can get anything from daddy, right? And and my sons are very close to mommy. What happens in society that when they grow up? You would think then that a man always will treasure a woman. And, and you know, I, I think when, when families get it right, it, it doesn't go wrong later. Where do we get it wrong? Because clearly in parenting, there's something going wrong. Oh, <laughs> we must understand this. See, this is, that's why I said, this is not against a particular gender. Mm -hmm. Well, a man wants a woman, all right? It's not that he's against her. Man-woman relationship is one relationship where there is too much overlap. You have to share everything from your bedroom to bathroom to including your bodies, <laughs> all right? Too much overlap. Even bank accounts, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wouldn't get into that. <laughs> You're going back to economics <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so because there is so much overlap, there is more room for conflict. It is a beautiful overlap only when there is an atmosphere of love. Once that's gone, when it's a transaction, this level of overlap is not healthy for a transaction. Transaction is good like this. This much overlap and so many things to transact on a daily basis, it is bound to cause friction. Only when there is a certain sense of love and devotion involved in this, then it… with that lubrication, all this friction will go on without much out… you know, manifestation of friction. Because the love dominates, yes. the love takes the space. Yes. So, today when uh, we are thinking of marriages and relationships with an expiry date in our mind… <laughs> Do we? A whole lot of people are, unfortunately. The world is coming to that. There was a time when people were anyway committed. When that commitment was there, Things came up, problems happened, they fought, again tomorrow they were close and things went on. Okay, today qu morning quarreling, evening fine, night full of love and morning again quarrel, <laughs> things were going on, <laughs> I'm saying. Because there is such a serious overlap of two lives and there will be bound to be areas of friction. If your… every family comes up with their own devices, of handling this friction. And some people fail to come up with devices because there is not enough commitment. If it was very clear to you, hell or high water, you got to be with the same person, then you would find ways to fix it. Now you think if it doesn't work, she is finished. When this is there, you are unwilling to find ways because between any two human beings, if there is so much overlap, if we are not committed, then being together is difficult. Every small thing flares up into a big thing. Smallest things will blow up into a place where today of course it leads you to divorce or whatever. This is because there is no long-term commitment, because we think there's always another option. Is it good, is it bad? It's not for me to say that, but I'm just exploring the problem <laughs> It's a big problem and I am focusing on family because really I, I believe it is the… it plays a pivotal role in society. And looking at the society we're living in and the children that we're bringing up, it's so dynamic. If they're looking for positive information out there, they will find what they're looking for. If they're looking for negative information, they'll find it. It's easily accessible. Um, this highly digital world we're living in. What are the key things that you would say we need to teach this young generation to keep them firmly grounded. Hello to all the people in the upper regions <laughs> See, when a child enters your life, it's like a bundle of joy which has entered your life. With a lot of pain, of course. With a lot of pain involved in bringing yes, forth… Yes, I can <laughs> attest to that. The women can attest to that. <laughs> Uh, but when the child came, 
things that you would have never done in your life, you start doing. You can't sing if for nuts even in your bathroom, suddenly you start singing. <laughs> you can't even bend down and pick up something, you can't touch your toes, but you crawl under the sofa along with your child, you know, you go under the furniture with him or her. Like this, many things, you sing, you dance, you play, you for moments at least, if not for good, for moments at least you forgot the concrete block that you have become and you became life once again, all right? But somehow all the adults believe they have to teach something as soon as a child comes. So this is… people ask me, Sadhguru, what is your sadhana? You did not read scriptures, you did not go to a teacher, you did not learn anything, but you seem to know everything, how is it? I tell them, this is the only thing that I did in my life is, I made sure that I am not influenced by anybody around me, whether it's my parents or the culture around me or the teachers or every adult around, because every adult around you, is trying to teach you something that's not worked in their life. Oh my goodness! <laughs> when I say something that's not worked in their life, between you and your child, if you look at it, who is more joyful? Your child. I'm asking who should be a consultant for life <laughs> One who knows how to be joyful for no reason, he should be consultant or one, even if everything is working your way, you carry a grave face and walk around the world, you should be a consultant for life, you must decide. So if a child comes into your life, it's not time to teach, it's time to learn. Once again, you could reinvent your life, you could learn what it means to be alive. Instead of learning what it means to be alive, People are carrying grave faces and going around. <laughs> grave is… grave will anyway come, you don't have to practice it on your <laughs> face. I was… I was speaking at the… you know, just a, about four weeks ago, I was speaking at the Stanford Medical University. I just looked around, these many doctors were sitting there, all… <laughs> many of them. I said, see, when you walk into your patient's room, Grave is one thing that you should not remind them of. <laughs> They're going, they might be getting there, so… <laughs> if somebody is not well in a hospital, you don't remind them of grave. It's very important that the doctor walks in with a different sense of vitality and life about him. So similarly, a child has come into your life means it's time for to live it up, once again to become fully alive, whatever your age. Your aliveness need not come down, isn't it? Our physical agility may come down with age, but why should your aliveness come down? If aliveness is coming down, it means you're committing suicide in installments. <laughs> That's what it means, <laughs> yes or no? Hello? <laughs> I'm talking to you, hello <laughs> Wow, that's powerful. So, <laughs> so children have come. Time to understand how to make something out of nothing, that's what a child is. You leave him anywhere, he finds an ant and he finds it interesting enough to make a universe out of an ant. We've given you a bloody universe and you're making nothing out of it <laughs> Everything you have today, compared to any other generation on this planet, you know more comforts and conveniences than any other generation ever before, isn't it so? But <laughs> why? <laughs> why means uh, because uh, traffic's a grown kind of. <laughs> well, you're sitting in your dream car, aren't you? <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> traffic is helping you to stay in your dream for some more time. <laughs> <laughs> you know
know, what you've just told us is stop trying to teach your children and start learning from them. Start living. We're such a complaining generation of people. Oh, we are the most whining generation on the planet, <laughs> ever. 